In a world governed by honor among thieves, what happens when two titans of the Mafia collide? Welcome to James Proctor Mob Stories. Coming up next, we delve into the silent but deadly feud between John Gotti and Vincent Chin Gigante, a rivalry that redefined the balance of power within the American Mafia. This is the first episode of a series that I call Revelations, where I take the Mafia and discuss its impact on society and culture. The two largest mob families in New York have historically been the Genovese crime family and the Gambino crime family. It's not like the families didn't get together at times. Whenever there's money to be had, cooperation took place. You saw that cooperation between Paul Castellano, the Gambino boss, and Chin Gigante, who led the Genovese family. However, the rub out of Paul Castellano was the catalyst that began a mob cold war for the ages between the Chin and John Gotti. You have two bosses who are Cosa Nostra to the core, but are totally different in their leadership styles. John Gotti is a man of flash and style and doesn't care who knows who he is. Being a gangster is Gotti's lifeblood. With Chin Gigante, you have a boss who operates in the shadows, is mysterious and brutal, but is an enigma himself, with what I call the crazy act, roaming around his neighborhood in a bathrobe, talking to himself, but it's just an act. Join us as we unravel this intricate tale of power and betrayal. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your insights in the comments. 1957 was a year of great change in the underworld, where you saw the Luciano crime family, which was to become the Genovese crime family, and the Anastasia crime family, which was to become the Gambino family, go through regime change. You had the attempted rub out of Frank Costello, the so-called prime minister of the mob that was shot allegedly by Chin Gigante himself. Then you had the infamous barbershop clipping of Albert Anastasia, the Mad Hatter. So you had Vito Genovese taking over the Luciano crime family and Carlo Gambino taking over the Anastasia family that year. Carlo Gambino led the family until 1976, and he ended up being the informal boss of bosses, which meant that he had the most influence of all the families. Vito Genovese ended up going to prison for drug trafficking, and when he died, the family went through a few different bosses. In 1976, the Gambino family had a smooth transition after Carlo Gambino's death in his own bed. It was decided well ahead of time that Paul Castellano would be boss, and concessions were made between Paul and his underboss, Neil De La Croce, on a division of power. Paul Castellano would be more focused on white-collar crime and left the traditional mob street rackets to his underboss, Neil De La Croce. Paul was considered very greedy, and that was evident in his relationship with the rival Genovese crime family. The Gambinos and Genovese were working together in construction contracts, and this was bringing in a lot of money for Paul Castellano. During the 60s through the mid-80s, the mob was impacting every facet of life with a public that was fascinated with the gangsters running New York. The unions were controlled by the mob. New York was in this building boom in the 80s, and we know that practically every building being built was controlled by the mob. In addition, the mob controlled waste management, the waterfront, the trucking industry, and the garment industry. Tourists going to Times Square would see the mob's influence, and the mob was flexing its muscle within entertainment and music. Paul Kesslau was focused on expanding his empire and pocketbook, and that meant working with the Genovese family. Knowing this, the Genovese were able to exert influence over Castellano, and that's no more apparent than the rub out of Frank Piccolo in Connecticut in 1980, where the Genovese complained to Paul that Piccolo was overstepping his authority in Connecticut rackets. So Paul Castellano made two grave errors. One, he didn't stand up for his longtime capital regime, and two, he allowed the Genovese to rub him out instead of Paul having a Gambino hip team do the deed. This was a sign of disrespect that was unforgivable to most of the rank-and-file Gambino soldiers. This showed that Paul Castellano was more interested in making money with the Genovese instead of defending and protecting a longtime capo that had done nothing wrong. And we know that John Gotti became boss through taking out Paul Castellano in the infamous hitting from a Spark Steakhouse, but how did Chin become the boss of the Genovese? Well, Chin Gigante became the boss in 1980, with the Genovese boss, Benny Squint Lombardo, stepped down as boss due to poor health. Ironically, most people thought that Anthony Fat Tony Salerno was a boss, but he was just a front boss. This was someone who pretended to be the actual boss to fool law enforcement, but make no mistake, the Chin was running things for the Genovese. And this ingenious move allowed the Chin to operate the family through the shadows. In 1985, we had the commission trial, and the feds actually charged Fat Tony with Rico and say in the court files that Salerno is the boss of the Genovese family. And the Chin is thought of as just this minor figure that was truly mentally ill. In 1985, things were about to change for the Gambino family. 
Paul Castellano had gotten caught up in the commission trial, and this was threatened to put him away for the rest of his life. And you had John Gotti, who was a capo with the Gambino family, and he had a friend, Angelo Ruggiero. He was part of this uh, Bergen crew, and he was being pressured to give over tapes that were being recorded by law enforcement, and this was needed for Paul Castellano's trial. Ruggiero wouldn't do it because the tapes were very damning. One, it admitted to drug trafficking, which was an offense punishable by death since the commission said, deal drugs and you die. Two, the tapes had Angelo Ruggiero talking bad about the boss himself. So during the summer of 1985, John Gotti and a group of Gambinos started planning the rub out of Paul Castellano. Frank Tachico, who was an influential capo respected by both those within the family and outside, went to other families for permission. They knew the Genovese would not get permission, so they weren't approached, but the Lucasian and Colombo families were approached, and they both said, go ahead. And, you know, this was such a risky move for Gotti and his group of co-conspirators, because if word had reached Paul Castellano, it could have created a war within the family. And Paul wasn't weak. He had two groups of killers. He had the Sicilian faction with the Cherry Hill Gambinos and the Westies. That was an Irish gang running out of East Harlem, and it would have made things really difficult. The Bonanno family wasn't on the commission due to the Donnie Brasco incident where the FBI had an agent, Joe Pistone, undercover. Uh, he was there for several years under the name Donnie Brasco, but Gotti knew he had allies with the Bonanos through his friend Joe Messino. The Paul Castellano hit occurs in December of 85, and John Gotti's made boss in 86. This unsanctioned hit angered Chin Gigante and Tony Dutch Corallo, who was the Lucchese boss. So the support that the Gambinos thought they had with the Lucchese family wasn't there. In April of 86, Frank Tachico, who was John Gotti's underboss, was killed in a car bomb outside the Veterans and Friends Social Club. And this was done by the Lucchese family on orders from the Chin. To make matters worse, the Chin had approached an influential capo of the Gambino family and supporter of Paul Castellano. This was James Jimmy Brown Fiala to take over the family. And the plan was that Gotti would be rubbed out, and then Jimmy Brown would be named boss with Daniel Marino, the underboss, and Tommy Gambino, the son of former boss Carlo Gambino's consigliere. Although Brown and Marino were involved in the plot, there's no evidence that Tommy Gambino was aware of it. And then finally, you had the Chin place contracts on several members who were involved in the Castellano hits. And these include Frank Tachico, who got rubbed out, Bobby Borriello, a driver and friend of Gotti who got rubbed out in 1990. Eddie Lino, he was a capo and one of the shooters at the Castellano hit who gets killed by the two corrupt NYPD detectives. And then Sammy Gravano, the future Gotti underboss, and Gotti himself. Gravano and Gotti survived numerous attempts on their lives. So what was the relationship between John Gotti and Chin Gigante? And did they ever actually sit down together? Well, we do have one confirmed truncated commission meeting that took place that include the two of them. In the book, Five Families, So and Rob mentions that in 1987, John Gotti sent fillers out to the Genovese through Sammy Ravano that he harbored no ill feeling towards Gigante. In the autumn of 1988, in the Greenwich home of a brother of a Gambino capo, Frankie Dapolito, the Genovese, Gambino, and Lucchese families met. You had John Gotti and Sammy Gravano representing the Gambinos. You had the Lucchese boss, Lil Vic Amuso, and his underboss, Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Gigante was there as the Genovese boss. On the agenda was whether to approve a seat on the commission for Vicarina. At the time, he was Persico's choice as the acting boss of the Columbos. Gotti endorsed Arena, and he also wanted to restore the Bananos to the commission by permitting its new acting boss, Joe Messino, to sit in and have a vote. Gotti knew he had allies with both Arena and Messino, and with them in his corner, he had control a majority of the commission and become the supreme leader of the nation's Cosa Nostra. Gigante and the Lucases had no objection to seating Arena as the Colombo representative to the commission, but Gigante was cool to readmitting the Bananos to the Mafia's ruling body. Before the meeting ended, John Gotti announced that his son Jr. had recently been inducted as a made man. I'm sorry to hear that, Gigante said, disappointing Gotti. Gotti had expected congratulations on his son's career choice, but Gigante commented that he would never bring his own sons into the perilous orbit of Cosa Nostra. Ironically, this is hypocritical because he does include his sons in the life later on. So what do you think is the reason that Chin Gigante is dismissive of Gotti? Was it because of the Castellano hit solely, or was it because of how flamboyant Gotti was? 
Whatever the reason was, their personalities were totally different, and they were like oil and water. So how did Gotti attempt to expand his influence within the commission and across other mafia families? When I look at this, it's a big parallel to the geopolitical Cold War strategies of the United States and the Soviet Union. And so we're going to explore the different chess moves that John Gotti was doing to counter the chin. We already discussed two of these moves in which Gotti was pushing to reinstate the Bananos to the commission with his friend and ally Joe Messino being seated. Also, Gotti was supporting Vicarina, and he did get Vicarina seated on the commission. Later on, you see that Gotti's supporting Vicarina and Joey Scopo, who was a longtime friend in the Third Colombo War between the Arena and Persico factions. Another move is how John Gotti solidifies his relationship with John Riggi and the De Cavacante family out of Jersey. In fact, it was the De Cavacantes who were brought in to take out a suspected informant, Fred Weiss, just a few years later. And John Gotti doesn't end there. He's also getting involved up in Providence and Boston. It's John Gotti who convinced Raymond Patriarca Jr. to step down as boss of the New England family. He told Patriarca Jr. that the commission wouldn't support him and that if he didn't step down, he'd be rubbed out. So Gotti's choice for boss was Nicky Bianco who took over, but he only had a short reign. And then in a final move, which is in Philadelphia, it's Gotti who pushed for and put John Stanton in place as the Philly crime family boss, replacing Nicky Scarfo, who had been put away in prison for life. All these moves were to strengthen Gotti's position with the commission. But did it actually work? We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the results of Gotti's political actions with the other families. It was a mixed legacy in my opinion. The Bonanno family did get reinstated on the commission, with Joe Messino taking the seat. Regarding the Third Colombo War, it got so brutal that the Colombo family was actually removed from the commission for several years in the 1990s. The tension from law enforcement on the five families were intense during the early 90s. And although Vicarina had the support of most of the family, the incumbent Persico family ended up victorious, in part due to their capital and longtime informant Greg Scarpa Sr. getting intelligence from a corrupt FBI agent named Lindley DeVecchio. Up in New England, you had a mob war that weakens the Patriarcha family considerably and resulted in their whole administration being put in prison. Finally, with the Philly crime family, John Stanford's reign is marked by war with the Young Turks, and when he ends up in prison in 1995, it's Joey Merlino and the Young Turks in control. So who was the true victor in the mob Cold War? John Guy himself goes to prison for life in 1991, in part due to the testimony of his underboss, Sammy Gravano, who decided to flip. After Gotti, the Gambino family tried to run things through a combination of ruling committees, Peter Gotti and John Gotti Jr., with mixed success. Chin Gigante faces the 1990s with several indictments that culminate in his 12-year prison sentence in 1997. And then in 2002, Chin Gigante gets another three years added to his prison sentence, and this time it's his son Andrew who gets caught up in the racketeering and obstruction of justice charges, and he gets two years in prison. And he gets a reduced sentence in part because of Chin Gigante pleading guilty and saying that he had been faking mental illness for many decades. Reflecting on the legacy of the Gotti-Gigante feud, you see the definite impact of the Mafia's power dynamics and even public perception. You see that the U.S. government became more powerful than the Mafia. It is able to use RICO and other tools at its disposal like using informants and the Witness Protection Program to dismantle all the five families. You have a deterioration in the quality of gangsters going into the life as Italian-Americans moved out of the neighborhoods. You have bosses today that had never been made 40 or 50 years ago. Teenage Italian-American boys have safer career choices as they're more likely to finish high school and go to college as families have moved into the suburbs. Both John Gotti and Chin Gigante were public figures. John Gotti is a dapper Don wearing his $2,000 suits and Chin Gigante walking around in Greenwich Village in a bathrobe talking to himself and acting crazy. But today, both families have gone away from the days of the Chin and Gotti. Both families operate in the shadows today. Murder is not commonplace anymore, but the mob is still being dismantled by informants, and the five families are just struggling to survive in a world where a lot of the old vices like gambling and money lending is legal. In the shadowy world of the mafia, can there ever truly be a winner? What are your thoughts on the Gotti Gigante feud? Who came on top between the Chin and John Gotti? Share your perspectives below and remember to like and subscribe for more deep dives into mafia history.
Until next time, take care, stay safe, and may God bless you always.